The first church I served at when I got out of the seminary was in Rochester, New York. And I had an opportunity one time to go to a notorious prison called Attica. And I went there to observe the ministry going on there. I remember walking up to this facility, just, it's a sight to, to behold, like a fortress. Two solid walls you gotta go through security. And the first thing he said to me, you can't wear a tie in there. So they made me take my tie off because they might strangle you possibly. And you go through all these security points, you get inside, and you walk in this room, and there's about 30 inmates in this room. Huge. These guys were muscly. See, back then, they didn't really have the opportunity to watch TV like maybe in prisons today. They had books they read, and they worked out, like, all the time. A couple of these guys walked up and gave me a hug, and I thought they were going to suck the life right out of me. They were so strong. And as I got there, the chaplain who was supposed to lead the service didn't show up. And so they asked me, hey, can you do a message? I said, yeah, how long? Two hours. I've never done a sermon for two hours in my life. I'm sure if I did a two-hour sermon right now, you'd probably be clicking off. But the bottom line was I began to preach, and the two hours seemed like 15 minutes because they were glued in. They were with me every single word. And when it got done, I mean, I felt the Holy Spirit in that room. I felt, you know, they're taking us in. And I got done and began to talk with these guys. We had about an hour of fellowship time. And I got to hear about their stories, about hardly any one of them had a dad who was a part of their life. And most of them were in there for murder. Most of them were never going to get out again. And every one of them expressed regret for the wrongs they've done. You see, in prison, what happened was they found Jesus. And they were some of the most free people I ever met in my life, that even as they're living in jail, in prison, they are free in Christ. And even though they, most of them weren't going to get out again, they told me their mission was to bring Christ to the rest of the inmates there. That was their calling. That was their mission. These guys are free on the inside. They go back out the world and they find out because of people living in freedom, they're living in bondage. And that's not what God wants for us. He wants us to be living in freedom. And, and today we see incredible principles to help us in that pathway to freedom, to live amazing lives that Paul writes while he himself was in prison. He would never guess he was in prison when you read these sections of Scripture. And there's a lot of formulas for life here I want to bring out to you, and I can't say there's one main point. Here's a bunch of points. Grab the ones that truly pertain to your life that you need to hang on to because they're all powerful. And I'm going to jump right in Philippians chapter 4. Verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. There we go, right away. Paul's saying rejoice. Find joy. He's in a dungeon. Find joy. No matter what your situation, how difficult it is, we can find joy. In fact, the Bible says be joyful always in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16. How can we find that joy? In Jesus. That no matter what the situation, he can bring good out of it. As we learned not too long ago. No matter what the situation, he is more powerful than what we're facing. We're victorious. We're more than conquerors regardless of the situation. He's with us. He's going to help us. And the more we realize that, we can find joy in all situations, including difficult situations, even when things are bad. Paul's in a difficult situation. He's still so happy. He says, not only rejoice, but again, I want to emphasize rejoice. Find joy in this life. Our joy is found in Jesus Christ the more we embrace his faith and live it out. It goes on. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Let your reasonableness. What does that mean? That's a big word. Reasonableness. Let's say balance. A life that's truly balanced in faith. A life where the emotions are following the facts of faith. Where the mind is embraced in the facts of our faith. And our lives are finding joy no matter what the situation because the facts remain the same that God loves us. We have eternal life in Jesus Christ. We are a balanced person. Whether things are tough, whether things are, are great, no matter the situation, we're balanced. We're steady, solid people. And people watch us in life. It's like, wow, how did you get that way? Jesus. He gives us the opportunity to tell the truth about it. And the Lord is near. He's with us. He's the one allowing us to have this reasonable life. He's living us by the power of his Spirit. 
goes on. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Do not be anxious about what? Anything. Okay? Worry in the present. Fear is related to the past. We have these phobias from things that have happened in our life. Anxiety about the future. What's going to happen? Here's the reality. We don't have to have any fear, worry, anxiety. Why? Because God is with us. He's bigger than the problems that we face. And here's what we need to do when you're starting to feel any degree of anxiety, fear, worry. It says, in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. We turn to God in prayer. God, here's a situation. I lay it before you. Help me out here. Help your joy to fill me, even in this difficult situation. Prayer is, is you know, we pray to God. Supplication is, is a different request that we make to God. And pray with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God. With thanksgiving. Because why? Even before he answers the prayer, we know it's going to work out for the good. He promises in his word, this is going to be the case. And the more that we understand that, the more we don't live in fear, worry, anxiety. You know what the number one killer of people is? It's called stress. The more that we grow in our faith, the less we have stress. In fear, worry, and anxiety. And praying to God to help us through no matter what situation we're facing, he's got the power to get us through it. Moving on. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That even in the midst of the storm, there is still in the hurricane, the eye of the hurricane where it's quiet, it's peaceful. This world's turning around. The storm's raging all around us. But Jesus brings us into the eye of the storm. We see the world challenged and going through difficult things all around us. But we have the peace of Christ. We are victorious in this world. Everything is going to work out. The peace that comes from God. A peace that is so incredible. And where you find peace, you find sacrifice. Why do we have peace with God? Because Jesus gave his life for us. We're called to be peacemakers. And sometimes that means standing out in faith and doing things sometimes that are difficult and challenging. To follow the example of Jesus because he's a God of peace. He wants to live in peace. And even in the midst of the storms, we find that peace. But it doesn't mean we sit back and don't do anything. We keep serving. We keep loving. We keep following the will of God. God, what do you want me to do in this situation? And the more we follow his will, the more we find that peace. We go on. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Wow. Back to the mind. Talked about that a couple weeks ago. The mind is powerful, but the mind has to be focused. We have to think about what we think about. And what are we supposed to think about? Paul gives us quite a list here. Whatever is true, think about the truth of God's word. You want to know truth? It's in God's word. Whatever is honorable, honorable, look at the life of Jesus. Model our lives more after him. Whatever is just or right, whatever is pure, Impure means a consistency on in the inside and the out. The more we grow in the Word of God, what's on the outside is the same on the inside. A lot of people, they can fake things on the outside, pretend like there's a certain way on the outside, but on the inside is totally different. Pure is inside and out. God's Word living through us, the Spirit guiding us in what we do, what we say. What's on the inside is on the outside. Whatever is lovely, God is love. And seeing how God works in the world, seeing the lovely things that God does, Whatever is commendable. This is a great list here. If there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Put your mind on the good stuff, on the things of God. That really is a summary of this list, is focusing on the things of God, not on the things of the world. We put our mind on the things of the world, we're going to be led astray. And our minds are going to become corrupted by the evil in this world. The key is to set our minds on the Word of God, what is right, what is pure. You know, I love this section. You know, a lot of young people come across big words, whatever, whatever. This is the whatever section. Our minds are focusing on whatever is good, whatever are the things of God. 
keep our minds in the right place, keep our minds focused on Jesus Christ and his love and his word that we talked about just a couple weeks ago. Moving on. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Paul is following the example of Christ. We are to follow example of Paul, which means to follow the example of Jesus. As Christians, to encourage one another, we are saved by faith in Jesus Christ. Awesome. That's great. But now in response and thankfulness for what Jesus has done for us, we want to show the world more who he is, to become more like him. And we're seeing this theme time and time again in Philippians. Moving on. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have received, revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, but I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance, and need. Okay, Paul is excited about the concern he's feeling for the church that is still in contact with him through letters as he's still in prison. And he's reaching out to them. Even in his dungeon, he's serving other Christian people. He's serving us. We're hearing his words from a dungeon. And he's saying, I'm so thankful you're concerned about me. But he says, he's learned a secret of being content. A secret, no matter what the situation, if you're in hunger or if you have plenty, if you're in prison or if you're free, no matter what we face in this life, there's a secret to being content. What is that secret? Verse 13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I can do what? All things through him who strengthens me. We have a God who can do anything. He can do anything. And here's the reality. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. You know, so often we have world-sized goals, human-sized goals. What I've learned in ministry is that God can do things that go far beyond what is humanly possible. But to believe he can do that and to let him execute that through us. Look what Paul did in his life. He reached out to most of the then known world with the gospel of Jesus Christ, starting churches all over the place. Ends up in prison a number of times. He takes advantage of the times in prison you know, to write letters to the Christians. He's continuously using his time in the best possible way to spread the kingdom of God. Because he knows that possibly his time might be short, and he wants to get as much done as he can before he goes to heaven for all eternity. You know, here's the challenge. In this world, so often, we grab too tightly to what is here. And it's just temporary. Everything's temporary. Our bodies are temporary. The things we have are temporary. Our achievements are temporary. Our worldly things in the end don't matter. You don't see the U-Haul at the cemetery. We don't take anything with us when we go. Our soul goes to heaven, but that's where true wealth is. That's where true happiness and joy is. We can experience glimpses of it here on this planet, but we're on a journey. And as we make this journey, it's a great thing for us to remember here. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And not just that, but all these sections. I mean, think about this. Be joyful always. Live a reasonable life. Don't have to have fear, worry, anxiety, because through prayer, God can bring his perfect peace to us. To get our minds wrapped around what is good, what is of God, not what is of this world. To put into practice God's word. Just as Paul did. It's not just enough to know the word, to believe the word, but to live it out. Put the word of God into practice, to live it out, and then we're living out more like Jesus. To be concerned for one another. As we see Paul was for those that are outside of the prison, they were concerned for him. But also to learn that there's a key to contentment. No matter what we face in this life, we can be content. No matter how difficult, no matter how good, because through Christ, all things are possible. I can do all things 
through him who strengthens me. My friends, what incredible formulas for life we see here, and I pray God will help us to embrace these as we make our journey to be with him forever. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for these amazing sections of Scripture, for inspiring Paul to write this from prison. Lord, help us to put these words into action in our own lives. We pray this in your name. Amen.